fresh air. It feels so good. So glad you are here to worship this morning, the seventh Sunday after Pentecost. I invite you to shake off the week that went before. Move and put your feet on the floor. Get settled in. Leave things behind and focus on being in the presence of God. Of course, you always are, but let us be mindful of that this morning as we turn in our faith we sing to our first hymn, 2193. We'll sing it through twice. God, we 
come to you this day, this beautiful blue sky day. The harvest is beginning. The fields are turning amber. People are busy at work in the hot sun, and we ask your protection and your sustenance for those who provide the food to sustain our whole world. Please keep each one safe as they do this work with heavy equipment. We ask that the weather continue to be a blessing so that the wheat that we grow will be good and can be sent around the world to feed hungry people. We're ever mindful, Lord, that there are those who do not have the wealth and the blessings and the peace that we enjoy in our country. Help us to be generous to share through our church portions, through the ways that we can, through Umpor and other things. We ask that you continue to be present with those who are in need of healing, for those who are mourning the loss of a loved one, for those who are lonely, for those who are sick. Help heal our relationships, heal our minds and our thinking, heal our bodies. We ask all of these things in the name of Jesus, your Son, your greatest gift to us, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. May thy kingdom come, may thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning is from Luke 11, verses 1 through 11. He was praying in a certain place. And after he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John taught his disciples. So he said to them, When you pray, say, Father, may your name be revered as holy. May your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins. For we ourselves forgive everyone indebted to us. And do not bring us in the time of trial. And he said to them, Suppose one of you has a friend, and you go to him at midnight, and say, Friend, let me three loaves of bread, for a friend of mine has arrived, and I have nothing to set before him. And he answers from within, Do not bother me. The door has already been locked, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give him anything out of friendship, at least because of his persistence, he will get up and give him whatever he needs. So I ask, so I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Search, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened for you. For everyone who asks receives, and everyone who searches finds. And for everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. Is there anyone among you who, if your child asked for a fish, would give a snake instead of a fish? Or if a child asked for an egg, would give a scorpion? If you, then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? After the fall of the Soviet Union, some of you may remember that, that Russia was not once Russia, but was part of the Soviet Union, with, along with other countries in Eastern Europe, including uh, Latvia and Lithuania. There was a biblical scholar named Kenneth Bailey, and uh, last week I used some quotes from him, and I'm going to share a story with you. He was, 
He was a guest lecturer at a Lutheran college in Latvia, in Riga. All of his students were between ages 25 and 35. Now that's significant because that means that they were all raised in the Soviet Union under the communist regime, which indoctrinated people into atheism. They did not want people to be religious. They did not feel that faith was part of their political ideals for running the country. So, Kenneth Bailey asked one woman who was there, a young woman, how she came to her faith. I'd like to share the conversation that he had with her. Was there a church in your village, he asked. No, the communists closed all of them, she replied. Well, did some saintly grandmother instruct you in the ways of God? No, all of the members of my family were atheists. Did you have a secret home Bible study, or was there an underground church in your area? No, none of that. So, what happened? In other words, how did she come to be studying in a seminary? This is what she told him. At funerals, we were allowed to recite the Lord's Prayer. As a young child, I heard those strange words. I had no idea who we were talking to, what the words meant, where they came from, or why they were reciting them. When freedom came at last, I had the opportunity to search for their meaning. When you are in total darkness, the tiniest point of light is very bright. And for me, the Lord's Prayer was that point of light. By the time I found its meaning, I was a Christian. Powerful story, isn't it? Of the importance of the tradition that we carry on each week. Sometimes it may feel rote. It might begin to feel like part of the window dressing of, of, our, of our service, but it's extremely important. It's simple, this prayer, and yet it's very powerful. It's been important in our Christian history. And in spite of the fact that some of us like to hear it the same way week to week, it has changed throughout history. Today we heard the version of the Lord's Prayer, the prayer of Jesus, that is in the Gospel according to Luke. The one that we pray in our service is more similar to the one that is in the Gospel of Matthew. However, both of them are different than what we recited. How can that be? Well, it's because we have a tradition that uses scripture and church tradition. For example, the last phrase, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever, and some Lutherans would add another forever on there, right? That comes from a teaching of a book called the Didache, or the teaching of the Twelve, which was a document that described the very early church uh, teachings of the apostles. It was called the teaching of the Twelve, and they added that part of the, to our liturgy. I don't usually leave in the footnotes, do I? And, and I take out even the numbers of our verses. But I think it's really fascinating for us to see sometimes how some of the words that we think are set in stone actually have changed and were told differently, prayed differently by different communities throughout history, through our Christian history. There were many manuscripts that were passed down from different communities of Christians all over the Middle East and in the Mediterranean and they prayed this prayer in their fashion, and scribes and monks copied it down and passed it on another generation, another generation. You might wonder why some ancient authorities are different. Some added some things in. I think footnote number two is particularly interesting. I'd never heard our Holy Spirit come upon us, your Holy Spirit come upon us and cleanse us. And I'm going to come back to that later in the sermon. But in other, other manuscripts would add, 
your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, because the monk who was writing this Gospel of Luke was uncomfortable with the fact that it didn't match the Gospel according to Matthew, and so they wrote in that section that was in Matthew into Luke. But that didn't happen for all of the manuscripts. Biblical scholars spend a lot of time in argument and research trying to find out what was the most authentic version that most likely was said by the people who followed Jesus in a particular setting. What was it that Luke intended you to hear? Now, I have been in churches where people were upset if I changed one word of the Lord's Prayer that is printed in your bulletin. Sometimes they don't like it that I even call it the Prayer of Jesus, but it was the Prayer of Jesus. It was also called Our Lord's Prayer. And I have been in other churches where they didn't want to use that prayer at all. And you might wonder, in the form that it's in, and you might wonder, well, what kind of Christians were those? Well, they were Christians who had had to repeat those words over and over so many times, so fast, that they felt that they couldn't really connect with the deeper meaning of what Jesus was trying to tell his disciples to say. And so they would rewrite the and find other people who had rewritten the Lord's Prayer in a way that captures the meaning of each of those phrases, but in a way that could sink into them that it was a part of the rote, memorized prayer that they had prayed so many times. Let me ask you this. Do you think that Jesus prayed this short prayer over and over and over when it said that he was on the mountain at night praying all night long? Probably not. Don't you think he had a more personal prayer that he wanted to share with God? He probably meditated, tried to be still in his mind and quiet his thoughts and quiet his heart. And yet, he gave us this prayer. A couple of reasons, I think. One is that he knew we, that his disciples were acting, asking for a prayer that could form the community identity. And it certainly has, hasn't it? You go around the world, whether you speak the same language or not, whether you call it the Nos Pater, or you call it the Our Father, or the Lord's Prayer, when people start to say it, you know the rhythm, don't you? And you can say it in your own language. And you know that you're all praying as children of God together. The second thing is, there was a, a biblical scholar a very long time ago named Jeremiah. He said that in this prayer that Jesus taught, the entire teachings of his ministry were encapsulated. You think about all of the parables about the kingdom of God, and there it is right in the beginning. May your will be done. May your kingdom come. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And did he not go about showing us how to usher in the kingdom of God on earth? It's a very simple prayer. When his disciples probably heard it, they might have been shocked immediately because they probably expected Jesus to tell them a prayer in Hebrew because in the, in the synagogues, they would use the holy language of Hebrew because that's what their ancestors had prayed in. That's what the scriptures were read in. But very, very few people actually probably knew Hebrew. They spoke Aramaic. And when Jesus gave this prayer, he gave it in Aramaic. How do I know? Because the ancients said Abba, which is the Aramaic word for father. Earthly father, like daddy, or like a respected teacher. You could call your teacher father, like a wise person, or someone who was a male dignitary in the community. It had all of those particular meanings, but when Jesus used it, it brought in a particular intimacy, didn't it? A family relationship. He taught all of us to understand God as a parent, as close as a parent, maybe not like an earthly parent, an imperfect person who sometimes disappoints us, who can't always be trustworthy, 
but the kind of parent that God intended us all to be, the kind of parent that only God can be. It's interesting when we think about the story and the parables that he tells right after it. Jesus talks about being persistent. Sharon Ring is a biblical scholar who says not only persistent, but shameless in our advocacy for what we need on the behalf of others. Imagine if I went to Sam's house in the middle of the night, Sam said, Sam, IGA is closed. I need some food right now. My family's just shown up from Idaho, and I'm pounding on his door. He probably would not only be woken up, but he would be worried that his neighbors would be woken up. But if I actually did that, I think probably the Haver Police Department would be called that somebody was disturbing the peace, too, right? It's a sort of a shameless approach to prayer that no matter what, no matter how often, no matter what it is, do not have shame about what you ask God because God wants to be there like a parent wants to be there for a child, a loving parent who would listen no matter what. I know so many parents would say that they, they, they counsel their children that if they're out and they get themselves into a situation where they don't feel safe, or maybe they've done something that they regret, call me, right? Call me. I think God would be just like that too. Say, pick up the phone and call me if you're going through anything that is difficult, especially when we're praying not only for ourselves, but for others. Every week we do this thing called joys and concerns. And we ask for your prayer requests, right? We believe in intercessory prayer because Jesus said that we ought to pray for others and we ought to do it shamelessly, persistently, to keep bringing it before God. Not because God doesn't already know, but because when we remember to pray for other people, it changes us. It takes us from looking inward at our own stuff, our own worries, our own problems that we do have, that we also take to God, but when we pray for other people, it reminds us to look outward. It reminds us to look at the needs of others around us, to look at each other as a community of God, as brothers and sisters who all call God our parent. Not only does it help us to look at each other, but it reorients us towards God, doesn't it? Sharon says that what this gift of the Lord's Prayer does is that God gives us God's presence whenever we go to prayer. Now think about it. Faith begins with a personal prayer, doesn't it? We've got to have a prayer, a conversation with God to even start our journey and initiate this pathway that we call faith. It starts with prayer, and Jesus promises that God will be there. And also, at the very end of the parable, lest we think that we can ask God for whatever we want, a new Mercedes, a new camper, maybe even restored relationships, a hope when we're feeling despair, thoughts to be taken away from us if we're feeling an addiction, all of those things can be taken to God in prayer, but the ones that God is going to hear are like a like a parent who wants to give you something good when you ask. Sometimes we might ask for something that we want that we think is really good for us. We might want that relationship that we hold so dear to us, but if that relationship is not healthy, then maybe God doesn't really want us to have that relationship, that friend who is not trustworthy, that we can't lean on because they've repeatedly shown us that they are not trustworthy, that they're not true friends. God would want better than that for us. We can still pray for that person, but we don't have to keep getting hurt. Also, God wants to give us a gift. Jesus comes to that at the end of the parable. He said, when, when you can ask the parent for things that are good, God says, 
he says that God will give us the Holy Spirit. Now think about that. Not only do we get the presence of God when we turn to God in prayer, but over time, when we're persistent, when we keep showing up for our prayer, God begins to change us. God's Holy Spirit comes into us and begins to change our thinking so that we have the mind of Christ and that we also begin to have the fruits of the Holy Spirit in our lives. That patience that is so hard to come by, right? That long suffering when you've heard the same story over and over again, but you listen one more time because you know the person needs to tell it. That generosity that even though you know your budget's a little bit tight, you know that you have an, enough extra that you can give. When you know that you can be kind to somebody who may not be kind to you, those are the gifts of the Holy Spirit. They change us throughout our lives. How do I know? How do I know that God is with us? Let me tell you a story first. This is a story from Florence Slauson Wellner. She is a, a theologian, a speaker of spiritual growth, spiritual development. She goes around the country and talks to people, and she had a woman who came up to her, and the woman was a veterinary technician. And the topic that they were talking about in this seminar, seminar was fear and about uh, remembering to trust God in times of fear. And the vet tech came up to her and told her a story. She said, as a veterinary tech, sometimes they receive animals that have been abused and abandoned. And she was telling about a dog that she had received that had a matted coat and it had sores on it because it had been neglected so long. It was half drowned when it came to them. And she knew that it, she could probably help this dog and that she needed to, first of all, clean its wounds if she was going to begin, begin to heal it. So she starts, she draws a bath for it, some nice water that's warm, gets the shampoo out, but when she lifts up the dog to put it in the water, it instantly starts scratching and barking and is actually screaming because it was terrified of water because they had tried to drown the dog. And so she thought, well, this dog must, must be clean. It must be healed. The only way to do this is to hold on to the dog and get it calm once again. And then she stepped into the water, holding on to the dog, caressing it, talking to it, gradually getting the shampoo and beginning to work it into the fur to clean up that dog. Dr. Waller said, this is the best story she's ever heard to describe the Incarnation, of what it means that Jesus came to be with us, to step into the waters that we step into, to reassure us that God indeed is holding on to us, no matter what we're going through, no matter how we've been treated, no matter what our worries and our fears are, we can be assured that God is indeed holding and loving us and wants us to pray and speak to us. There are some who don't believe in intercessory prayer, but they must not be reading the New Testament very well because God and Jesus always are urging us to come with our needs, to come with our concerns, to come with our prayers, to come with our joys, to come with our gladness and sing a song of praise. And that's what we do every Sunday when we come to worship, is to be together and remember that God loves us like mommies and daddies are meant to love their children. Let us turn in our hymn to a song that was inspiring to John Wesley. He was on a ship um, on his way to the Americas, thinking he was called to be a missionary. And he went through a terrible storm, and he heard this Lutheran song, very ancient. That's why I'm asking Mary to play it on the organ. It seems like this is an ancient song. It should be played in the way that it probably was played back in the day. And he translated the words that were being sung by these German Moravians um, who sang this song. 
This is Give the Winds Thy Fears, number 129.